almost there. Amazing. So we are live on YouTube and, and on, on Twitch. Twitch. This is Amazing. beautiful. Andrea, how are you? I'm good. It is an intense morning setting up all of this um, and working on improving what we're doing. But I'm very happy that we got here almost on time for today. And we're starting this regular habit. Yeah, we're a bit late. How Sorry, everyone. And um, I'm very good. I'm very excited. I'm trying to put out what we're going to be discussing today. And um, I'm super excited for this live. Uh, we set up a Twitch channel and uh, reactivated our YouTube channel last week only. So it's um, very, very, very new, new, but very exciting. And then do you want to tell us a bit, um, so one, who we are, <laughs> and two, um, kind of what's going to be happening today? Absolutely. So who we are? My name is Andrea Venzon. I'm one of the co-founders of Atlas. The other co-founder is here. Hello, hello. Her name is Colom Kainsavada. <laughs> Her name is Colom Kainsavada. And we are here because a few years back, we started a movement called Atlas um, because we believe that basically we need to find a way for humanity to come together uh, to say it in a very uh, rough way to survive and to, um, to actually thrive and hopefully to solve the biggest problems of our time. Um, we started this two years ago. We worked on many different topics, many different campaigns that have been incredibly exciting so far. And just a few weeks back, weeks back, we had a, a little enlightenment, a little moment of ta-da, where we understood that we need to do something more. It's not enough to campaign. It's not enough to build organizations. We actually might want to build a country. And that's a very strong slogan. But the idea is basically to find a platform, a way for people like all of us um, to go beyond borders and come together for real, not only in spirit, but actually uh, under an institution, a constitution, in a governance, and try to solve the biggest problems of our times. But we're going to tell you way more about this in just a few minutes. Um, I now want to send the mic to Colombo. Um, so let me just explain what we'll be doing then today. Because uh, Andrea introduced us. Again, this is Andrea. I'm Colomb. We are the co-founders of Atlas. And last week, we talked a lot about the news, how they're global, why they matter, and so on. Today, we want to do it in a bit of a different manner. So we've been reflecting a lot about how those channels can be most useful. And don't hesitate to send us your tips and thoughts and so on at the same time in the comments area. So what we'll do, as Andrea said, is we want to build a country. But before explaining why we need to build a country and why we think it's needed, let's talk about the need, right? So we're going to go through a few news to show, and Andrea doesn't know which news I want to talk about. And I prepared a few news to talk about to show how the world is very messed up, how we're heading towards doomsday, whether we like it or not, um, and how today's biggest issues are not actually being solved. So that's the first thing we're going to do. You can comment, send us the news in your country that you think are not being solved because they're not only local or national, but global, and we'll be reading them out. After this, we'll show why those news are not being solved. So I'll tackle topics into climate, to democracy, to populism, to food insecurity, and, and we'll talk about why we can't solve them at this stage. And spoiler alert countries can't solve them. We need yeah. a global governance or global federation or global country. And after this, um, we'll discuss kind of the wh why we think a global country is the solution, hence my spoiler alert. Um, but it sounds very out there. It sounds a bit like weird, you know, right? We to be other, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we'll explain how we think we can do it and why we're doing this YouTube channel and how we think this YouTube and Twitch channels can actually help in building this country. How does this sound? Well, if you ask me, it's an amazing idea. <laughs> if you ask our viewers, they are uh, coming on the platform slowly. I'm sure they, in general, like the direction we are taking. So I hope they're going to like this new proposal. Cool. So I prepared a few topics on there. I hope you read the news this morning. And um, I literally didn't have a lot of time because we had a lot of work this morning to go deep into it. But I selected some news. And I put them into, actually, we could do something into Halloween, but I didn't think of doing it like trick or treat. Is it uh, bad or is it a treat? But I've, I've prepared them on the different categories. The first one is politics gone wrong. Um, okay. And how national politics are going wrong in the wrong direction. 
and, and how this leads to the rise of the far right in Israel, how even a positive result in Brazil is actually not that positive if you think about it, and how Lebanon uh, political crisis is leading to cholera. So anyhow, how the world is fucked up because of politics. Number one, we're going to dive into that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> then we're going to talk about climate through Nigeria's flood's perspective and why this is not a Nigerian problem. Okay, um, very interesting. Everyone, again, please send us the news you think of global relevance in your country. This is full of my own biases when I open BBC and try to select some news. We'll stay on, because um, we're going to talk about Nigeria through a climate lens, but then it leads to food insecurity topic. And this would be the perfect transition into Russia and Ukraine. And for this, there are a thousand angles of why in today's world we are not solving wars and so on. Today, I didn't choose to go into the electricity topic and the fact that Russia is committing so many war crimes by targeting power grids and so on. But I chose to go into um, grains and Russia putting out of the grain deal, which would impact food across the world. And then based on how long this took, I have two topics. I mean, I have one real topic, and the other one is just because I want to talk about it, but I didn't <laughs> find the, the global relevance angle. So the real topic is Twitter, but not Twitter and Elon Musk, and not Twitter and the blue tick, and not Twitter and all of those things. No, no, these are super interesting. No, no, it's not this. And it's uh, Twitter and um, the lack of global moderation and the issue with complying with national laws only. So it's a whole other angle. And then, as I said, there's something I want to talk about. I'm not sure if it's relevant, so tell me if you guys don't want to hear about it. But I really want to speak about Guantanamo. Um, Why so not? <laughs> there's a lot. So just to recap, we're talking about all of those topics to show that the world as it stands cannot deal with global issues. And I'll explain why some of those are some global issues. And the coolest part of all this is that I have no clue about this news. You just told me for the first time. I mean, I hope you read the news this morning. I, I read some of the news, not all of them. For example, I was not aware about Nigeria, but very cool. One time I'm not in here about this for a while, but I know the situation. So let's try, let's try. Okay, so politics gone wrong. I think it's like kind of a horror situation right now, which is perfect to discuss on Halloween, how politics is so fucked up and should actually be giving you um, the biggest scare of your life. Uh, sorry, I'm quite vulgar, by the way. I should not be saying those words. And part of this gone wrong, let's start with Israel. And again, so I've chosen angles for all of those news because it's possible to discuss them forever. So if we get into the Israeli-Palestinian situation, Israel committing countless crimes against humanity and so on, that's not the topic today. We'll yeah. tackle this another day. But it's so fun. It's so interesting. Yeah, I don't think fun is Not right, fun, but I... No, no, we're not talking about debate. this today. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about the rise of the far right. And um, through different angles. So I read a few analysis this morning. For those of you who don't know, Israel is going into yet another election on Tuesday. Um, so the government keeps on folding. They're not managing to, um, to have a stable government and so on. This is linked to so many issues, such as the fact that Israel is actually a state of apartheid, where Palestinians are second-class citizens, don't have access to the same rights, don't have access to the same housing. And the rights are consistently being cracked down upon. The rule of law is not respected. They're being bombed. They're being attacked. Uh, disproportionate use of force. I can go on forever. But there's also the rights of the far right within Israel and within Israel's citizens that are allowed to vote. And at first, when I read this news, I was like, and eh, this is like all over Europe, all over the US. You see the far right rising and rising again. It's a cycle, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then I read an analysis um, from a Israeli journalist that was explaining that it's actually super different because normally the rise of the far right in Western countries is linked to um, high levels of um, migration and okay. refugees. High levels, that's again debatable. Like uh, if you look at the refugee and migrants population in Europe, it's so small. I think it's a political crisis, not a refugee or migrants crisis, but it leads to migration or perceived high level of migration. Okay. Low economic growth and an increase in inequalities. So often those are some of the factors that lead to the rise of far right across the world. Is it the case in Israel? Or? And what this journalist was saying is, but those are not the same factors in Israel. In Israel, you have more or less relative growth that is stable over the years. You have very low levels of migration. You have very few refugees or migrants actually in Israel. What was the other factor I mentioned? Perceived high rise Perceived inequalities. Higher, yeah. Oh, yeah, inequalities in Israel and Palestine are huge, but not within the Jewish population. So, if I'm like, if I'm um, part of the Jewish community in Israel, how how's my lifestyle? I, am I like living as a I don't know an American in terms of uh, lifestyle or in terms of? Uh... 
I don't think it's very comparable because you have the whole security or fake security issue that the state is putting on you because it's a state of apartheid and it's trying to convince you that you live against enemy that you need to um, protect yourself against. But the fact is, the far right doesn't come from the same factors we used to. The far right comes from um, pure racism against uh, Arabic people, for example, okay. and, or uh, Zionism. Uh, it doesn't come from um, the same lines of thought uh, or the same feelings in Europe, which I thought was quite interesting. And the very worrying fact, and I can't pronounce his name, so I'll just read it, um, is that in Tuesday's elections, you have a religious Zionist alliance, which is like one of the most far right, and um, that could come as high as third place cool. in the polls and take a decisive role in the potential outcome because it's a proportional system of governance. Like you have to include... Yeah. It's not like in France we have, I'm French, we have two rounds for the presidential elections. And so you have one winner, right? In a lot yeah. of countries, it's proportional. So you have more. Um, and the leader of this crazy far right um, alliance is called Itamar Ben Jbir. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and for example, in the last couple of days in an occupied East Jerusalem neighborhood, he pulled out a pistol and called for Palestinians that throw stones to be shot at by the police. This is the level of like insanity happening. So Netanyahu, there is like the the main candidate is gonna probably work with this person. He's already quite yeah. right wing, right? He's, he's quite conservative, very like about protecting uh, Jewish rights, uh, Israeli rights, and so on. I mean, the the Jewish state and its government tends lately has been quite Zionist, so it's a uh, Jewish supremacy and so on which is to the exclusion of Palestinians, which is the detriment of Palestinians. So they have a settler's uh, uh, mindset where they kick people out of their homes, occupy it, they don't uphold international law. There's been multiple, multiple, multiple investigations, um, judgments and so on into the fact that they're committing crimes against humanity, war crimes, etc. So already it's not a, it, it's a horrible situation. Yeah. It's a situation of apartheid. Like think about South Africa. It's a similar situation in today's world. Yeah. Right now, you have someone even more, and it's not, I don't know if far right even really yeah, it doesn't applies. It's like it, just yeah. even more Zionist who's coming in and is literally saying, You throw a stone, you, we should shoot you. I mean, think about the disproportionate use of force, right? Yeah. Um, and because people, and apparently a lot, uh, what this article, I can actually send it after, in, foreign, um, in a foreign policy journal was saying is that a lot of young voters um, are considering voting for him. Let me find. And just for the our audience and who's following us right now, when you say Zionist or Zionist, I'm not sure about the, the right uh, way to say, it's basically this philosophy they say that um, the Jewish state is, is a supremacy over other, um, anyone else that is in Israel, right? It's this kind of philosophy. So how Wikipedia says it is a movement that um, basically believes in the establishment or support for homeland for the Jewish people centered in the area roughly, roughly corresponding to what is known in Jewish tradition as the land of Israel, okay. um, which corresponds in other terms to the region of Palestine, uh, the Holy Land, and a few others. Oh. It's understood, Here. however, Zionism is like, for me, it's kind of Jewish first, right? Like the way it's applied in Israel is to the exclusion of Palestinians. Yeah, okay. Palestinians do not have the same rights, the same human rights, and so on. They're not being upheld. Yeah. Let me just, you can comment for two seconds on it if you want. Well, I think it's super interesting. And I mean, it just adds to the whole, so for, for I think you mentioned before, but this will be the fifth election in two years. So clearly Israel is right now in a stalemate with a lot of tension and the situation um, between the, the Jewish community and the, and the Palestinian community is, is not getting any better. And actually it's, uh, animosity within the faction is, is increasing and increasing. So uh, add, add to the mix this kind of additional fuel that is the fact of having a far, far right candidate or more more, more extreme candidate even than before. Um, and you see how dangerous um, can the whole mix become. Um, and I know you, but I'm, I'm very concerned. I, I know that this thing can add a lot of create massive problems worldwide and obviously especially in the region. Exactly. So, by the way, I just sent the article I mentioned. We like to do things with sources. We don't like fake news. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mentioned, I'm sending at the same time the articles um, that I've researched this morning. Most of it is from BBC, to be honest. But then when I'm mentioning opinions, I'll just send them in. So, that's the best thing I wanted to discuss, as you said. Like, it's politics gone wrong. So, Israel, already the political system is fucked up. But then the far, far right that literally says, 
a Palestinian for the soul you shoot them is for me like it's difficult it's to go more wrong than this, right? And when are the elections again? Sorry. On Tuesday, so tomorrow. Yeah, whoa, very, very soon. Yeah. I'll explain the link between all of them after, even though it's 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 far fetched. The second politics gone wrong is um Brazil. So Brazil is on top of the news this morning, and I actually had a discussion with you about it this morning. Yeah. And to give the context, until this weekend, uh, Bolsonaro, who's a crazy, crazy far right uh, equivalent of Trump, but I think even scarier yeah. in um, Brazil, was in power. Bolsonaro, like, doesn't believe basically in climate change, doesn't believe doesn't believe in science. During COVID, he was without masks, calling for people to take it off, etc. He's been burning down and destroying the Amazon, which is responsible. Lots, yeah. Yeah, the Amazon is basically, to picture it, it's the lungs of the planet, right? So it helps us survive. Without it, it's part of the whole destruction of the environment. At one point, the planet will die, we'll all die. So pretty shit. And, and Bolsonaro basically is like, climate change is not a thing. And we can mine, uh, we can destroy, we can deforest the Amazon. I don't know the proper words, and I don't know enough about it. And COVID, hooks, uh, go out without mask. And, and then he also attacked a lot women, LGBTIQ plus people, and African Brazilians, and the left in general, like he moved Brazil towards more a neoliberal democracy than a democracy. Yeah. Despite the fact that Brazil in general is quite of a welcoming country. Like yeah. it's traditionally very open to LGBTIQ plus rights. It's, I mean, a land of migrants and migration. So he really kind of changed the narrative compared to the many previous governments, I mean, from Lula to uh, um, Rousseff, like uh, her, he's a prime, um, former aide, and yeah. so on and so forth. Exactly. And he's been, I mean, he's so scary. Like, you listen to yeah, him, like, crazy this, this, he's crazy. And um, he ran a campaign to be reelected on, for me, it's just like, it's a hateful person, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, his entire narrative is hateful. It's hateful towards others, towards other countries, towards anything that this basically, for me, kind of anchors us into humanity. Right? It's like, fuck the future, fuck future generations, let's destroy the planet, let's get rich now. And the left doesn't matter, inequalities, who cares? LGBTIQ plus people, protections, no, etc. So very, very scary. And then in, in this political saga, you have Lula, who comes in. Mm -hmm. And Lula was already... Who comes back in. Exactly. I was <laughs> going to say, like, he already was president for two terms of Brazil. Um, and he's a socialist, he's from the left. Um, I know socialist is understood in different ways in different countries, but that's also how he defines himself. And, and then was imprisoned and convicted of um, corruption, right? So in itself, not the best person after you've been convicted of corruption, and he was also banned from holding political office again. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically not the best contestant. Yeah. Then I think he was released and his conviction was um, cleared. No, he was not declared innocent. And the, what happened, if I, I read this morning, is that basically the procedure uh, that led to his incarceration was not conducted properly, to say very vaguely. And so basically not the right court was working on, on the case. And so basically he got re released. Well, his conviction was annulled. Yeah, it was annulled. But not because it was shown that he did not do what he, he was claimed uh, to have done. So basically receiving a, a bribe from a construction company. Interesting. He declared himself the biggest victim of a judicial lie told in the country's 500 years. I mean, obviously, like he, he probably declared himself innocent, but what I want to say is that there's okay. not been a verdict saying he was innocent. The point is, like, he's someone who already run the country. And I actually didn't... So there's the whole question of corruption, of whether after you paid um, your yeah. dues, he didn't stay in prison for 26 years and so on, but, like, after you paid your dues, you can run again. But that's actually not what I... Today, I decided not to go for the obvious thing and politics gone wrong, right? Yeah. That's not the angle I want to tackle. The angle I want to tackle is democracy. Because Lula, to um, unlike um, Bolsonaro, believes in climate, believes in social justice, believes in lowering inequalities, yeah. believes in inclusion, believes in rights, right? So he's way more on my side of the political spectrum. He believes in, in humanity. He believes that we should be equal. He believes we should protect the planet, etc. And then he told me, yeah, but actually he stands with dictators. I mean, yes, 
there, there have been a lot of, I mean, it was a different time when he was in power. It was 2003, 2010, so a different world. Um, but he was close to China. He was often considered close to China. Um, I remember he was also very involved in the nuclear, Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, so that's positive, but also because he had ties with, with Iran. So um, that's a bit what, what he's known for. And it's not just 10 years ago. Um, so I went, I, I went to research his pitches. Uh, by the way, I don't speak Portuguese, so it was difficult. Um, but I went to research his um, speeches, and he stated, for example, so on Venezuela, let me introduce Venezuela <laughs> for a second, because I know not everyone is aware of what's happening. In the meantime, I'll do some social media for the live. Sorry about that. Um, so Venezuela is uh, one of the neighbors of Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. It shares a border with Brazil. Yeah. Um, and Venezuela... Actually, I don't know. So let's pull up. I'm going to check. I'm going to check. You could pull up Google Maps before I'm I say something stupid. Yeah, um, so Venezuela um, has been rocked by political instability and has been descending into a humanitarian crisis. It does. Yes. <laughs> I got my geography right. Good job. So it's been descending into a humanitarian crisis for the last couple of years. That's because its um, so-called president, Maduro is his name, um, has been becoming a dictator, basically. So... He cracked down on the opposition, uh, cracked down on rights, cracked down on free elections. There haven't been free elections held in Venezuela. Um, there's, as a result, an opposition president called Juan Guaido, um, who was elected um, by the National Assembly after Maduro basically failed to conduct public free elections in 2015. Um, there's, in 2015, were the last three-ish elections, um, and Maduro lost the Senate, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. Um, and since then, there's an opposition, Senate, and so on. So Venezuela is um, being isolated by a lot of countries on the international stage, being sanctioned at the request as well of the opposition, often, and in order to push for free and fair elections um, that have not been happening in many, many years. Um, President Juan Guaido is recognized by many, many countries across the world, and others that tend to have more authoritarian ties recognize Maduro. Yeah. And Brazil currently does not have, if I'm mistake, if I'm not mistaken, diplomatic relationships with um, Venezuela. A little side note is suddenly countries like the US are kind of becoming more friendly to Maduro because Venezuela has oil. Um, and with the sanctions on Russia, countries are like, ah, we need to get it from somewhere. Maduro is actually not that bad. Let's go to him. So Maduro is, is kind of being welcomed slowly back onto the international stage, but still is not allowing free and fair elections. And Lula, um, who comes from a party that traditionally is very aligned with Maduro, um, didn't outright support him, but said, for example, that he would um, reinstate fast diplomatic ties with Venezuela's government. Yeah. And by Venezuela's government, he means Maduro. And um, so on democracy, while well, he's great on some stuff, on democracy, which for me is a fundamental topic when talking about politics, he's not the absolute best. So that's what I wanted to do with like politics can run in Brazil. It's when the opposition does not stand straight when it comes to, even though I'm very happy again Lula was elected as opposed to Bolsonaro. But when it comes to democracy and rights, um, it's nice to say it at home, but then you need to be able to uphold it in your diplomatic relations. I completely agree. And so what's your take on the outcome of the election? What I just said. No, I know, but like, do you think that this term is going to be very positive? Do you think that there are going to be other scandals? Do you think that this is the best that Brazil can do right now? And I think that it's representative of a wider political issue across the world. And it's the same with, with Israel. It's the fact, and I want to get to it at the end, it's the fact that our political systems are not able right now and to deal with fundamental issues that we're facing. And this is due to politicians' own failures um, and own mistake. But then you have much more than this. You have the fact that um, because, so for example, a, a reform I believe they gain is the fact that people who hold high office should not be able to be in power for more than one term. Yeah. So I believe in longer terms, like five, seven years, if you're president, but then for me, you should not be able to run again, just so that you don't have a risk of political corruption, of becoming an oligarch. Or something like this. Okay. And I think a lot of um, political um, issues come from the system itself, from the fact that um, we only have politics at the national level. So a lot of the topics cannot be solved 
but um, that we're facing, but uh, we expect our politicians to be able to solve that, like climate. One country cannot solve climate. Um, that uh, the system is not designed for citizens to be able to participate uh, regularly. If you had citizens' assemblies, if you had ways for citizens to participate in the making of laws, um, if you had ways for citizens to yeah. vote on agendas and so on, I think political systems would be much more stable and politicians would be of much higher quality. And it leads to one last point is, if you had ways for diverse voices to get to power. Again, we're talking about two white dudes on here. Yeah. Um, so in a country that is very diverse. So, like, there's a whole lot of issues, but for me, it's what things gone wrong in the topics, in how they handle crisis, and then in the system itself. I think you gave a very, very good account of the situation, and also, I fully agree with you. There are many things that we should change in our, in all political systems, not just our, talking about Western uh, countries, or something, but, like, all countries have, um, no one has really cracked how to modernize democracy, how to think about the new way of democracy and how to actually deal with the fact that even um, when there are, you know, parties or factions that have the best interests at heart, then there's always a risk of a bad leader coming in, uh, screwing up everything. Um, and this is something that, um, yeah, it's very, it's very hard, hard to, um, to fix. Um, but I share with you also that for now, for Brazil, this is a very good news, basically, bottom line. Um, there is not more, you know, it's like when Trump was left the highest seat in, in, in the US, people might not like Biden, Biden might not be exciting, might, might not be like progressive enough for our views, but surely it's such a good thing not to be Trump anymore. Uh, being able to press a button and like launch a nuclear strike or disregard other countries' interest and be always, always uh, on the attack and trying to mean to bring down minorities and so on. So I think that it's a good news for Brazil. I'm personally very sad that the best option to have someone that first of all is very old, that has a lot of scandals behind him. Um, and I hope something better for Brazil. Uh, but let's take what we have. <laughs> yeah. So this is not quite is going wrong. This Actually, is going... it is, but you need to let me uh, finish. So <laughs> to scan. recap for the... Um, for new people coming. And today we're talking, I'm Colombe de Sandra. Today we're talking about how to build a country and why we would need a global country. And first, the way we're doing it is by going through the news to show that there's some themes across the world that come back. The first one is politics going wrong. We talked about Israel's far right, about Brazil's and good news in terms of Lula, but bad news in terms of diversity in the political systems and holding people accountable. And the last one I want to mention, which is very apparent, is um, Lebanon. Um, so okay. let me take my notes at the same time. <laughs> and I want to talk about Lebanon, in not just Lebanon in general, since um, the Beirut uh, port explosions and so on, but about cholera, um, okay. to link into other topics after, to link to climate and so on. So right now you have the beginning of an epidemic of cholera in the country. And cholera, from what I've been reading, is transmitted through unclean water. Um, and it's in place places where the most basic sanitation systems have broken down and the spread can be very rapid. And it's something that is preventable for clean water, et cetera, et cetera. And, and right now the country's political failures are literally creating a cholera outbreak because the country now no longer has um, clean water everywhere and so on. Which is crazy. Which is insane for a country that was doing well-ish a couple of years ago. Um, and let me just, I, I just wanted to bring you a few facts and then and then for you to comment on it. Yeah. So there were elections in May, but there's still no new government that has been formed. Um, the national electricity grid provides just an hour of power a day. Wow. If even. The currency has lost around 90% of its values and medicines are hard to find. More than 80% of Lebanon's population is living in poverty. And now you have cholera. And for me, I mean, Lebanon is such a complicated case, so I, I don't want to get into even the whole religious topic into all of this, but it's really politics gone wrong. Yeah. It's how political corruption, because it was a very corrupt political system and politician system have been extremely corrupt, leads to cholera. Literally, like... In 2022. Exactly. No, it's completely crazy. I mean, like, uh, Lebanon just a few years back was, uh, as you said, like, country with a lot of difficulties, but doing way better than now, way, way better. And just the inability of the political system to uh, wake up, to 
keep a decent standard of behavior, to think about the best for season for once, led to many uprising that, however, did not manage to overturn uh, the current governments, the current uh, kind of like clean job power of certain families. Um, and now this leads to a, mo a modern nation to have co an, a cholera outbreak. And one hour of electricity per day. I mean, that's unthinkable almost in a, in a country that again was doing very well. Exactly. Years back. And so for me here, you have a few things. So I we took free news, we commented along a lot because it's, it's, um, it's messed up. But what I wanted to show is politics across the world um, faces similar issues. Yeah. We face systematic issues of not involving citizens enough. Uh, a vote every five years is not citizens being democratically involved. Uh, we need to have more. So not involving citizens enough. We face issues of corruptions over and over again, linked to a lack of transparency, linked to a lack of strong enough institutions. Uh, for me, to the fact that it's too easy for politicians to hang on to power and uh, not to be kicked out. Hence, again, I'll say it again because I really believe in it. One term out, done, by like over, and um, and linked uh, to a lack of diversity as well. Often, and this we saw in Israel, we saw in um, in uh, Brazil and um, Lebanon, but we see it all over the world. Like Italy has had seventy governments in six years. It's ridiculous. The UK is following on this track, and it's happening in every dem democratic, non-democratic, uh, wealthy, non-wealthy country. We need to reform politics. It's very interesting this thing that on one side we have instability, and so democracy seems to be a, a lot of shortcomings compared to more like uh, dictatorial or autocracy type of, of governance. And on the other side, actually, despite the stability, is always the same people very often uh, winning election and sitting in parliament. Mm -hmm. And so there is a lack of innovation, a lack of uh, inclusivity, a lack of access for many actors. And I believe that for a lot of those things, working together across borders, learning from best practices would help in solving political instability. Which leads me to the to second topic of the day. And everyone, please, I see people um, sending questions. We, we're including them as we go. Um, so let me read so, out this one. This is a very, very interesting question. Uh, about just Brazil. so you know, what we're doing is talking about the news to show how news are global and how we need a global system to solve that. Yeah. And given that we are live on two platforms, uh, Colombia, if you read the... Um, question out loud, uh, our YouTube followers will. will also. So Dark Sag, a something, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, says, what do you make of the rumors of Brazil's military taking power in the country? People are saying mm -hmm. it's a real possibility of them rerunning the elections and ensuring they come back. What would Brazil and the military will look like? How would the Biden administration and other nations deal with a military regime in power? Sure. I know way back many decades ago, they had one, and it was violence and yeah. Severely repressed the people. Um, so just to give a bit of context for those that are not maybe familiar with the situation in Brazil. So yes, there is an history of military dictatorship in Brazil. And I think that the reason why this question is coming is because yesterday during the election, so during the electoral window where people were going to the ballot and vote, there were a lot of instances of the police and the military apparently um, slowing down or blocking voters from accessing the polls. Uh, and obviously the claims were where these people, these, the military forces were pro-Bolsonaro and they were trying to avoid uh, for people to be able to cast their ballots. If I'm correct, if I remember, I read this morning, most of the, the situation was solved when the Electoral Commission basically issued an ordinance to, um, uh, in order to all the military forces to stand down. However, um, if I'm also correct, Bolsonaro still did not uh, acknowledge uh, the defeat. So obviously, if you put this this kind of like elements together, and maybe our user on Twitch on Twitch is actually way more updated than we are on this. But just as 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 a as an assumption, if you put these elements together, you see okay, there is a risk of um, military takeover, military influence in the electoral process. And on the other side, there is the favorite candidate of the military that did not um, did not recognize his defeat. And so it's again a potentially explosive situation. Um, what I can say, just like I hope the Brazilis, Brazilians yeah. and Brazilian institutions are strong enough uh, to, you know, to resist any any kind of takeover. Um, and I'm sure that if this were to happen, if anything was to take this direction, I, the international community would be very strong um, against against such act. I don't know what Biden in particular could do. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of um, sanctions that can be put in place. 
I ensure they are international far for this. Um, but at the end, I really, I really think that the, the Brazilian people uh, are the ones that, that can prevent this. And they have done it in the past, they are strong. So this is my, uh, my hope. I don't know, Colombia, what, what do you think on that? No, I agree. And to link it back to the rest, I think, you know, we see this in so many countries when there was a big fear when Trump lost that he would not concede power. It's the case over and over again in so many countries. And this is when, again, for me, it's the risk of like oligarchs coming in, right? When you're yeah. in power, you accumulate power. And that's only, look, imagine I was president of France, will never happen, but imagine it. I was president of France for like five years. Obviously, I get so many business contacts, so many military contacts, so many journalistic contacts and so on that I have way more power than anyone else who's running against me, whatever happens. So if I'm also allowed to run and run again and again, the risks are much higher. Yeah, I think you need to limit one times offices for... for... It's very true. And but what I usually say is that apart from like the, yeah, exactly. the risk of like clinging to power, the problem is that obviously when there's a military back um, government, junta or just leader, they tend not to go away. The problem is they, they tend to disrespect any democratic uh, process and cycle and just basically say, look, we have the power, we have the guns, uh, we are the most influential institution in the country. So we stay until we think it's the right time uh, to, to uh, relinquish power. And we saw from history um, that normally this doesn't happen. It's very, very difficult then to overturn. You need revolution, you need crisis. Um, and I think that what we all hope is that Brazil will not turn this corner. Um, I think Brazil is, a, apart from being a beautiful, interesting country and so on, but it's also a country with a lot of potential. Um, there's potential for growth, there's potential for better social justice uh, policies, there's potential for being kind of the forefront of the climate revolution because of obviously their natural resources and so on. So I think that the best hope we can send to all Brazilians are following this and just in our own, own space is um, we really, really hope that Bolsonaro will not make this um, historical mistake and all the military do, do, do something like that. Exactly. So again, other, thanks for bringing the military aspect to the politics gun wrong topic. Let's jump to climate. Um, and please continue to discuss on the chat and so on. We'll be answering um, questions and comments and new ideas. And the idea is also for you to send us like news that you think are relevant to the world, what, what you think can be done and so on. So we learn from your experiences. Yeah. Um, climate. So I wanted to talk about Nigeria's floods. So right now, almost one in 10 Nigerian residents experience flooding so far in October. One in 10. Um, Bayelsa, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, is among 33 of 36 Nigerian states grappling with the devastation of the country's worst flooding in a decade. More than 600 people have been lost in floods, and almost 1.5 million people have been displaced. Why? So Nigeria's current flooding has been attributed to above average rainfall and an overflowing dam in neighboring Cameroon. But the situation has also been exacerbated by poor drainage infrastructure. With a warmer climate causing more intense rainfall, authorities also blame climate change for the floods. So I wanted to talk about this not only because it's depressing, because it's horrible, because it's depressing, because we need more attention on this, because we need to give support to Nigeria, to the government, because we need to give support to displaced people and so on. But because here you see, again, the global aspect quite clearly. Yeah. Number one, you see that uh, it's at least... Uh, an issue between two countries with um, the dam in Cameroon, right? Yeah. So that without global collaboration, you have no chance for the future. And um, that's the first point. Number two, you see that there's the element of climate, that Nigeria is paying the price for the climate crisis. We saw floods um, in Pakistan earlier this year, and now we sit in Nigeria with one, with one in 10 Nigerians being impacted by the floods. And this is, again, a topic for me where it's insane, right? Like, for example, often developing countries are the ones that contributed the least to the climate crisis, with yeah. rich countries being the ones that um, polluted the most, the most and destroyed the most our environment. Yet developing countries are the first ones to pay the price. Um, and often without financial assistance, without retribution, without anything um, uh, for them. And I wanted to bring it about because for me, there's no clearer sense of we are all in this together and we have no chance and we completely fucked unless we work together than with climate. 
Um, I think that's a perfect example. And it also goes along with many news that we've seen recently. Like, for example, we, we're both based in the United Kingdom and in Europe, and it never had such a warm October, I think, in 200 years in Europe. Um, and this led to actually through a lot of disruption, for example, dry river, um, crop failures, and so on. And then you see Nigeria, um, uh, the example that you've said, and I'm, I'm sure there are so many examples like, of climate climate issues uh, hitting people, especially in those countries that you said. Um, they have produced less emissions, they have actually suffered a, a lot through East, throughout history for many reasons, and then they get this on top of that. Look, I think climate is the perfect example for what we're trying to do for one simple reason. I think no one has a, need, a, a, a real idea, idea of how to solve climate change. People talk about more cooperation, uh, cutting emissions, um, intervening where it's possible. The truth is that for how the world is working right now, no one figured out how to do it. Even if tomorrow, um, the great activist uh, for, against climate change in the US managed to convince the, United, the US administration to cut emissions by 80%, this will not be enough to stop climate change, unless China, India, and many other countries do the same. And the UN doesn't have this kind of leverage to influence policy, um, and so we're not stalemate. So this is a perfect example of why we are doing what we're doing, where we think that a global, let's call it a global institution, this can be a country, a federation, a stronger intergovernmental organization, but we need a new platform where the will of the people, exactly how it happened in, in Brazil, the will of the people is listened to. And if we believe that the climate emergency is actually a priority for humankind, there is no national interest or business interest that can stop us from changing this, from stopping this, from ensuring that yeah. across the board, emissions are cut new solutions are found, uh, and we actually move forward as one. Well. Completely agree. Um, one of the elements I wanted to mention is how all of those topics are interlinked. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but I moved from um, politics um, to, uh, and politics gone wrong to health. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can include uh, climate in this. And then we talked about um, I mean, we diverged a bit on different topics, but we talked about climate because climate also impacts health. Now let's bring about food um, and food insecurity. So with Nigeria's floods, there's a big risk of a food crisis uh, yeah. going on. Obviously, when a country goes underwater, um, food is impacted, food access, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about it in Nigeria because I'm trying to show global links between you. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to bring about Russia and grains. And um, so when you talk about Russia, right now there's a thousand angles of how Russia is committing crimes across the world that impact us all, right? There's the fact that they're um, striking Ukraine in heavily civilian, popul civilian populated areas, striking power grids to leave Ukraine cold and dark during the winter, which mainly impacts civilians, which is illegal. Um, because in a war, you still have to protect civilians no matter what. Forcing their own citizens to go to war against their will. Exactly, and so on and so forth. But I actually wanted to speak about food security. Yeah, let me pull out my stats. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know all of this by, by heart. Um, so I, I wrote down a few thoughts. It's really not comprehensive because I prepared this in half an hour, <laughs> linking different topics, so please feel free to input. The first one is, so basically, when Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, um, so quite a few months ago, it took hostage a big chunk of the world's cereal trade. Because Russia's naval blockade of Ukraine's ports made it impossible for Ukraine, which is the world's fifth largest wheat, wheat exporter. So fifth largest, it's, it exports it's wheat to a lot of countries across the world to ship its crops, driving up global food crisis and creating a global food, and so driving up global food yeah. prices and creating a global food crisis. And we've seen it when the UN became super involved in trying to broker a deal because there were famines going on all across the world, food insecurity, and one of the biggest food exporters was basically blocked from doing so, even though Ukraine still wanted to do so in the midst of the war. So there was a deal that was brokered and um, for uh, ships to be able to live with wheat so that uh, people would still have access to food across the world. 
uh, Russia and Ukraine agreed to it. The reason for which, again, it didn't happen, just to clarify, is not because there, there was some fighting. It's because Russia imposed a blockade on the oh, ports. Dear. And Russia literally held hostage wheat, wheat, sorry, I can't pronounce it, wheat, <laughs> and that could not reach the world, creating a global food crisis in the middle of floods, famines, and so on. So not only is Russia committing war crimes in Ukraine, but it's literally holding the world hostage. Yeah. Then um, this weekend, Russia accused Ukraine of uh, bombing one of, an, one of its ships or like uh, sinking one of its ships um, in the area. Okay, cool. Uh, Ukraine it's, denies it's it. It's war, I mean, by the yeah, way. Yeah, and Ukraine denies it. And so Russia said that um, it has to pull out of this weed deal um, to guarantee the safety of civilian sheets carrying grain from Ukraine. This is so fucked up. Let me repeat. So Russia, as she said... We can't continue to, exp to to enable Ukrainians to export wheat that will uh, stop famines and, and not disturb disturb uh, global food supply because there's a safety risk. The safety risk is Russia. The whole safety ri yeah. risk all along has been Russia. Russia blocking a port. Russia attacking Ukraine. Russia committing all crimes. Russia bombing and striking cities. Russia not enabling wheat to get out. Ukrainians want to get it out. If Russia abides by it, the wheat will get out. So the streets again, like I just wanted to mention it because we're talking about food insecurity in Niger in Nigeria. It's again like Russia is the sole threat to win yeah, the world. Sure. And is blocking it, pretending. Oh, it's uh, another it's another news where like honestly, if, if we were not to propose a solution, I would say the world is really in a bad situation. Because I mean I mean the whole obviously war in Ukraine is completely crazy. Uh, it's a war of oligarchs in Russia that need to find something to destroy the population and to uh, extend the imperialistic dreams outside. Um, and that's already very bad. And then you see how this war between two nations is impacting uh, thousands, millions of people uh, across the planet, maybe even billions. Um, and obviously who pays the price is very often those that are suffering the most. And these are across the board. In developing countries, in uh, highly developed countries, you always have people that because of these geopolitical fights um, they are um, being played elsewhere, uh, will have more difficulty in accessing basic goods, like in this case, bread. Like very simple, simply is, is the, the oldest problem on the planet. When there are a famine, then people die, uh, people tensions rise. Um, so yeah, I think that basically it's another example where the international system, but honestly, human society as a whole, has massive shortcomings. Um, exactly. And, and we, have, we need to find a new way. Let me introduce the last topic because we've actually been speaking for 48 minutes about news. <laughs> and we have other things to talk about as well, <laughs> which is Twitter. So, I wanted to, so we talked about food, we talked about politics, we talked about democracy, talked about climate, and talked about health. Let's talk about um, technology. And Twitter right now is on top of the news because uh, Musk completed his takeover of the platform. And I'm really scared. I like I like Twitter until now. I'm very, very scared <laughs> of what will happen. Um, and there's so many scandals exploding, etc. But I don't want to talk about recent history of Twitter. So I'm trying to link it in a bit of a different way. I want to talk about um, Twitter and moderation, but not with the whole moderation council of Musk because it, it won't work and who cares. And I want to talk about it in terms of national laws that do not work. Okay. And I will take an angle that will not be very popular in general because I'm very progressive, as you must have guessed by now. <laughs> and I want to talk about Twitter banning Trump. And Twitter banning Trump. Okay. So Twitter applies moderation, and a lot, I'm taking Twitter, but it's the case of a lot of um, social media platforms apply moderation. And sorry, Andrea needs a key. I'll actually, I, I get it. Continue. Right, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And applies moderation rules based on national laws. Yeah. So Twitter um, will apply US law or US standards, um, Chinese law, Chinese standards, and so on. But Twitter is a global platform. So if you look at it, like Trump, I, I really dislike Trump. I'm very happy he's not on Twitter. <laughs> like, that's not the point. Like, but Trump was banned from Twitter. Yet uh, you can have Chinese officials responsible for genocide. On the platform. Iranian official uh, uh, responsible for massacring protesters. Exactly. And, and for me, if you start looking at the different examples, it's insane. Like, yeah, Trump is really bad, whatever. How is he allowed 
not allowed. But then you have Putin that can be on Twitter if he wants to. Yeah. Like, this is insane. It's it's literally like Twitter is a global platform. So I understand that sometimes you have to operate or that you have to operate according to national laws, but you should have global moderation and global standards if you're a global platform. Twitter is accessible in all countries. I can, or acceptable in, in, accessible in most democratic countries. I can access foreign diplomats accounts and so on. There should be a global standard. Yeah. It's crazy. insane otherwise, and in some countries, some things are allowed and others are not. But that's another example where clearly the world we live into does not fit anymore in national boxes. And this is not to say, like, we're all digital nomads, it's super cool to travel. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, like, services that we all use, and I'm saying all, regardless where you live, you're very likely to be, have access to social media nowadays. Um Situation like climate change that impacts us all, whether we are Bezos or a very poor farmer in a developing country, and so on and so forth. These situations, these issues are not national anymore. Like, they are for sure some national issues. There are some local issues, and that's completely understandable. But there are things that are really, really changing our life where we have no control upon. And so we end up being impacted by standards that we didn't vote for and rules that we did not accept. Uh, and also things that we would like to have better, but we can't because they are outside of our control. Yes, agreed. <laughs> no, I completely agree. And that is the perfect transition. So to recap, because we've been speaking for a long time, and, and I'm very happy you said this, it wasn't planned. <laughs> um, we explained that, so again, I'm Kurom, this is Andrea. We've been talking about the fact that Atlas, which is the movement we built, and um, that is across 134 countries, we have 22,000 members. We want to build a global country or a global federation, however you want to call it. And people jumping into it, we wanted to show the need for it. So what we've been doing, so let me try again. <laughs> people jumping into why we want to build a global country, a global federation, we wanted to explain the need for it. And so we talked about political systems gone wrong at the national level. We talked about Brazil, Israel, Lebanon, Lebanon. and, and Nigeria. Nigeria. And cool. how different, well, for political systems, we talked about Brazil yeah, yeah. and Lebanon and Israel, and how those show that political systems at the national levels are not working properly, and that we need to learn and do better and learn from one another and collaborate. Then we talked about we talked about climate and how we can't solve it without um, working together. How Nigeria's floods are a clear sign, a clear case example that we need to work together across borders, that we need to have a uniform way of, for example, um, banning fossil fuel subsidies, yeah. of stopping 100 companies that pollute like most of, uh, of the world's uh, pollution and so on. We then talked about uh, food security and how right now you have some countries that are literally holding the world hostage, like Russia, that is putting out of the grain deal with Ukraine um, and the UN. And now about the lack of global standards for moderation on social media platforms and how it's insane. And this and that is when I spoke a lot <laughs> about the news. I would love it if you can explain now. You, you mentioned that you know issues now are not into boxes anymore, into national boxes, yeah. and how countries are not um, fit to solve them. Um, so how? Yeah, maybe explain that more in details, right? Like. What is happening with nation states and um, why can't they solve this issue for the political angle, the electoral timetable angle, but also for the fact that it's just like problems are global um, and what's happening at the global level? Let me do this. I mean, this is a tough job, right? <laughs> After the news, we need to get into why we're doing what we're doing. And let, let me give you a preamble to this. Uh, I'm not a super globalist. I didn't live in 55 countries. I do not travel every weekend. Uh, I, I'm Italian, I speak with an Italian accent, you can hear very well. Um, and, but I just think that basically we have reached a moment in human history when we need to make a jump. Uh, this happened before, it happened 400 years ago when from kingdoms and uh, localities, we, nation states were starting to be created. It happened when empire crumbled and we became more, uh, less colonialistic progressive in the last 50 to 70 years. So there are phases in human history when things change. Um, and I think that one of the last ones that we have witnessed, or I did not witness, but many people that still like witness, is when the United Nations were created after the Second World War. 
the world were, was clearly in difficulties, there was a risk of nuclear annihilation. And so someone, people came up with the idea, let's, let's try to cooperate more, let's try to prevent war. And that worked somehow uh, with lots of limitations. Now we need something new. And I think that because of all the news that we discussed, but anyone around the world can see that we are in a phase of historical stress. Uh, it's difficult to be optimistic. Issues are growing, becoming entrenched. Uh, polarization, uh, wars, nuclear wars is, might be actually an option. Um, climate change, as I said before, is an issue that no one is managing to, to tackle. So clearly, we need something new. And this is what in, in the last two years we have been thinking about. Uh, Colombia and I come from a political background. We have created a European political party across Europe. So we know that it's possible to work across borders. In the last two years, we, we have worked with people across the planet. We've created a global community, 20,000 people strong nowadays, where we basically have explored how, whether you are uh, in South Africa, in Canada, or in Vietnam, you can actually cooperate and try to go beyond borders. Um, and I think, I'm saying this uh, with a lot of optimism, I think we might finally have got the answer. We might have finally got what could yeah, be but, the but next first, thing. First, let's explain why nation states <laughs> actually don't work. And uh, so if you maybe want to go into this first. Like... So we give a little break to the explanation. So people are like, what the hell um, So nation states don't work because, um, let me take one concrete example. Uh, a different one than, than climate that I took before. Let's take uh, inflation. So right now I live in the United Kingdom. Inflation is a like passing 10% of, um, of uh, the, yeah, the, the monthly yearly inflation. Um, and there's very little that the United Kingdom can do to tame this inflation. They are trying their best. The Bank of Lin in, I'm trying their best, not really because the government is not doing very well. But like, let's assume they were doing their best. The Bank of England was changing interest rates. Uh, there were measures to help the population. But the truth is that these kind of issues um, come uh, through other, uh, because of other situations, like the food shortage in, uh, in uh, Ukraine that we discussed before, the fact that um, the, the Russian state decided to block the supply of wheat across the planet. And so, the UK cannot do anything. You would expect the, Unite, the United Nations could do something. The United Nations could maybe, as a global platform, try to ensure that issues like the food shortage would not happen, and hence inflation would not hit me in the, in the United Kingdom. But sadly enough, the United Nations has no such power. Why? Because it was built in the second, after the Second World War, is basically owned and ruled by five countries, including Russia. So United States, China, Russia, France. What you mean here is the permanent five, right? Of and the Security Council. Yeah, I was going to go there. And the United Kingdom are called the permanent five, as Colombia just mentioned. So basically they have power of veto uh, on all the most important topics in the United Nations. Um, and so this is actually preventing the United Nations to do anything meaningful when there are, there are crises. Um, and then... So countries try to go beyond that. They, they try to align in other ways. However, each country has a different electoral timetable. So whenever there is a crisis, I don't know, uh, across, let's say, Europe, it might well be that Germany wants to solve it. But in the meantime, France is undergoing a democratic transition with different heads of state, a different head of, head of state coming in. And so they do not manage to work together to solve it. So we are basically tackling global issues in a very, very inefficient way. And as such, we often do not tackle them. And the problem is that right now we are actually in a moment of history where the technological power we have uh, can actually lead to great successes or, or massive failure. Uh, the, the stress we put on natural resources on the planet is so great uh, that if we don't do something on, in time, uh, this might lead to very, very terrible situations. So we're at a crossroad. Basically, the, the whole system doesn't hold. The problems are so great that we need to find a solution. But not many people are proposing a solution. People are hoping that there is a better leader some, somewhere that does something. Um, but we know that there is not enough. 
And I think it's clear there is not enough. It's not like because Lula was elected and many people are happy about it, that suddenly the Amazon will be saved and uh, climate change will, will be tamed. And let me add one point. Like, we think of, of countries as inevitable, right? And despite the fact that I've been working on this idea of uniting forces across borders for a long time, like I still define a lot myself as French mm -hmm. or as someone living in the UK and so on. So clearly, it still defines a big part of my life. Yeah. However, countries were created uh, not that that long ago um, when basically we understood that for administrative purposes, we should limit or delimit. How do you say it? Limit. Should, not limit. We should uh, draw lines um, in on land uh, based on how many days it takes you by horse uh, to get from one side to the other to be able to collect taxes or something like this, right? Like countries were done because we couldn't travel far, we couldn't travel fast, and and so on. And out of the greed of some people that wanted to accumulate power, yeah. borders were never a must for a long time in humanity's history. We did not have borders. We did not have countries. We had mobile people that uh, somehow managed to co-live. Yeah. And yet today, our entire way of life is determined by where you were born, which country you are a part of, where you live. And um, not only our way of life, because I'm French, so in a way I'm very lucky. It's easy to get visas in a lot of countries. Um, I live in a safe country, safeish country, and so on. Um, but whether humanity will survive is determined by countries, yeah. by the lack of countries, lack of ability of countries to work together, by the lack of ability of countries to collaborate, uh, by the fact that the UN is made of authoritarian countries where the people don't have a say. So it's a very weird concept in itself. Like a, a human-made concept done out of convenience uh, when now today you can wake up in Shanghai and go to bed in New York. Um, you can cross the world faster than ever before. You can connect on social media with people from all across the planet. Yet we still obey by the same delimitations. We, that's the word, delimitations. <laughs> we created um, so long ago. It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. I fully agree. And that's why we need to think about something new. And um, here now I can say it, there is the big revelation. It's not a big revelation, but you can also probably get it from the title of, of this broadcast. <laughs> but basically what we have been thinking the last few weeks is that we need to find a way, a democratic way to unite people across the planet and ensure the big decision like how to deal with climate change or how to stop prevent wars are taken together by people coming from across the planet in a democratic way. And they are a few ways to go about it. But for sure, something that is extremely needed is the idea of building a new platform. And I'm using platform on purpose because this platform um, can be a country, can be a federation of nation states, can be a new institution, um, an international institution that is actually democratic. But we need to create a new place for people like me and you come together to debate issues, to elect representatives that are democratically accountable and can take decisions on behalf of humanity as a whole. Right now, this does not exist. The United Nations is not this. Um, forums where leaders come together are not this because leaders do not answer to the needs of humanity, needs to the answer of the electorate or people or party in certain places. So we must build this new place for humanity to come together. And our hypothesis is that here we call it provocatively a country because it might be a global country accessible to everyone, might also well be just an institution where countries come together. But it must be certainly enough democratically accountable because without the power of the people, the will of the people to um, empower, to uh, give legitimacy to the decision that this body or this, this institution can take, we will never be able to take that decision like the one of cutting emission, like the one of ensuring that uh, the crime of um, uh, coming from the colonial era are paid back, or um, the fact that we need a common space program to ensure the survival of human, the human race. This kind of decision needs the, the backing of people across the planet because they're expensive, they're difficult, require going beyond differences, as we've said before. So that's why we want to build basically a country. And 
this effort we're doing today, and we started last week to broadcast our thoughts and invest time in explaining what we're doing, in involving people and uh, confronting um, difficulties and, and, and doubts uh, online are um, part of basically the big effort we're doing. So we are gonna have a lot of these live videos um, for normally like three days a week at least. We're gonna be live on YouTube and Twitch and we're gonna discuss with you and crowdsource ideas on what we're doing. Um, and then we're gonna have probably a more structured piece of content a week where we're gonna tackle one topic within the big task we have ahead of us, whether, for example, how do you build belonging to such an institution that is global? How do we ensure that the elections are free and fair? Uh, what's the best governance for such an institution? So all these vertical topics, we're gonna try to do them in a proper way. And this is the beginning of a long path. It's the beginning of a year long consultation they wanna launch last, next year for people to contribute to this project in a formal way. And, and then more and more uh, and of this effort. Did I explain well, Colin? Yeah, so basically what we're doing here is through those channels, we're going to be talking about how to build a country. So we, we did a long intro. This week, we're actually doing intros. So send us your thoughts, send us your feedback. We're kind of playing around to see what works, what doesn't work, how to explain it. So this week, again, we, we're trying to show the need for it through news, through talking about what's happening across the world. Mm -hmm. But then through those channels, we'll talk about how to build concretely a country. We're cutting it as Andrea said, a country. It can be a federation. It can be a democratic global governance. But something where the people have a say, where we come together across borders and where we solve um, global issues. And um, in how to build a country, we'll look at really cool stuff. Like at the past, how were countries created? How was Japan created? How was the NHS service created? Um, how was the first coin uh, and, and uh, currency created? Uh, what is a country? We look at philosophical questions, like what makes a country? Uh, do citizens have to give um, their approval? Uh, is there a need for a social contract? Do we need a country? What even are services? Um, do, can you have a belonging to multiple countries? Do you need to have sovereignty over a territory to have country? Not from a legal perspective, but from a philosophical perspective. Yeah. After this, we'll also um, look at new tech, like can citizens today create countries with blockchain, with crypto? And are there new types of services and needs that are not being answered to by today's countries that can be answered by a global country? Mm -hmm. And so we'll think about innovations and country making. And by the way, spoiler alert, yes, citizens can create countries. <laughs> it's been done in the past, but also there's nothing to say that a global institution, a global federation can only be created by a few elites in the room. Like we can all be part of this. Um, so we'll talk from next week in a more structured manner about those things. And then as we, as I said, we are launching a, a very long project on global governance. And I already sent the website actually in the chat that you can uh, check out. Um, but we'll basically do three things. We'll launch global consultations. I'm repeating it. You said it. Yeah, so it really cool. enters people's minds. <laughs> as of the 1st of January, we'll run. Sorry, I need water. I've been speaking too much. We'll run consultations on um, what global governance do people want. Is it a country? Is it a federation? Do we have a parliament? Do we have direct democracy? Um, who holds power? Um, is money a thing? Uh, so we'll, we'll consider governance for a year and, and do those consultations online and offline across the world. If you click on the at last link I sent, uh, you can sign up to it. Then after this, we'll adopt uh, democratically this vision of the world and um, we'll make it gain momentum by um, running a campaign when the UN Secretary General is being selected. So it will be a stunt campaign, um, but we'll run primaries, we'll try to make the UN more democratic, we'll ask them to adopt this vision, yeah. even when they refuse because they are undemocratic. And we will start building those institutions ourselves and those channels here that you're watching us on will um, serve the purpose of showing how to build, uh, showing the steps and the many missteps, I'm sure, on how to build a global governance system. So it's a long, long path, but it's exciting. Um, and I think that someone has to begin, uh, to start. So we're gonna succeed, we don't know. We know that it's the beginning of a, of a conversation. It's the beginning of something that maybe in 10, 20 years will lead to a very, very big change. Um, so very excited to start. Um, these acts are long and we need to get trained for it. We're going to get better. 
Uh, but I'm very happy that so many people contributed with a very interesting discussion, especially on the topic of Brazil. Um, but obviously the topic of Brazil is a topic for many, many of us because of what we said. Um, so I think that uh, that's the way forward. Um, we are going to have a lot. We're going to have a, another live tomorrow and on Wednesday. Same time, same place, uh, YouTube and Twitch. Um, and I think that more and more will advertise, so more people will participate. It's going to be bigger, rather bigger. Now we're going slowly because we need to learn how to do it as well. And so, so again, for an hour 15, is not easy. Exactly. So we, ne we need to really, really learn how to do it to become anchor people. Um, but I really feel more confident now after the second one. I feel like we, had, we are almost there. <laughs> uh, so if you want to join us tomorrow and keep on to the, to the discussion, this week is about exploration, so we're going to keep on like discussing about the ideas. Overall, the plan we have, a uh, news that can make us think uh, about the need for a global country. Um, and hopefully, we're going to arrive to Thursday or Friday with a very good idea for uh, the month ahead. Do you agree, Colomb? A hundred percent. Did you share all the global news you wanted to share? No, there's so many more, but I can't <laughs> anymore. My brain is going like, ah, save me. So I think we have done uh, everything from today. Thank you so much for following us. See you tomorrow, same time, same channel. And send us your tips. Again, we are getting started. So we want to hear what you like, what you don't like, ways of making it bigger and so on. Bye. Thank you.